Hey, you're listening to the History of Ancient Greece podcast. I'm the Ancient History Guy, and I'm honoured to be featured on this podcast. Thanks, Ryan. I run the YouTube channel Ancient History Guy, an animated history channel discussing ancient warfare, battles, civilizations, and major events in the ancient world, with new videos every single Monday. I also occasionally cover a little bit of medieval, just to spice things up. Now let's let Ryan get on with the podcast. Thanks again, and I'll be seeing you around. Enjoy! Hello, I'm Ryan Stitt, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 83, Eleatics and Atomists. Today's episode is brought to you by our new October Patreon supporters, Daniel Leon and Eduardo Boada, as well as PayPal donor, Chris Jensen. Once again, I do apologize if I didn't pronounce those correctly, but I do thank you for your donations and support of the podcast. If you too would like to support the history of ancient Greece, you too can become a monthly Patreon supporter or one-time donor at PayPal. Links to the various sites are in the show notes. And now, let us turn our attention back to the ancient Greeks. The Greeks of the time of Homer and Hesiod had viewed the earliest state of the universe as a formless void that they called chaos. And from chaos, the order of their own world had emerged, known as the cosmos, a Greek word meaning both order and beauty which is where we get words such as cosmetics, for makeup, or cosmetic surgery, to improve appearance. Mythology served the important function of grounding the growth of the cosmos from chaos in various actions taken by the gods. But the great contribution of the 6th century BC Greek thinkers of Ionia was in their determination to abandon this mythological and religious framework and attempt instead to explain the world by natural processes alone. As we saw in episode 20, the Ionian rationalists, which included the likes of Thales, Anaximander, Anaximenes, Xenophanes, Pythagoras, and Heraclitus, had focused on the natural world rather than on the values of the human community. However, their speculations raised inevitable questions about the relationship between gods and mortals, as they sought to enthrone human reason as the tool for understanding the universe and to replace divine plan with natural forces. The 5th century BC was a time of great upheaval for the Greeks, as the Persians tried to invade mainland Greece on multiple occasions, and the two alliances led by Athens and Sparta faced off in the Peloponnesian War. But it was also a century that saw significant achievements in Greek philosophy, mathematics, science, and medicine. Not only did this century see the mature careers of Parmenides and his pupils Zeno and Melissus, as well as that of Socrates, but it was also a period where the Pythagoreans built up their mathematical systems, when Greek medicine really started to get going, as we discussed in episode 78, and when Anaxagoras, Archelaus, Empedocles, and the atomists, Leucippus and Democritus, developed their ambitious cosmologies. Given the chaos and war that was gripping mainland Greece, and the domination of Ionia by client kings of the Persians, it's not surprising that in the 5th century BC, a lot of the philosophical action takes place further west in Magna Graecia, though even those places were dragged into the Peloponnesian War in the later part of the century. Parmenides was born in Elia, a Greek colony in southern Italy that was founded around 535 BC by Phocians fleeing Ionia after the Persian conquest. The dates of Parmenides' life are uncertain, but he seems to have been born around 515 BC and lived no later than 440 BC. Parmenides descended from a wealthy and illustrious family, and so as a young man, he appeared to enjoy politics, even being involved in the writing of the laws of the city. But a Pythagorean named Imenius later convinced him to abandon politics and take up scientific research. He did not become a Pythagorean, though, because he followed the teachings of Xenophanes, which appealed to him more. In fact, according to Diogenes Laertes, Parmenides was said to have been a pupil of Xenophanes, who himself had made his way to Elia after the Persian conquest. 
Parmenides has been considered by many scholars to be the father of metaphysics, or the philosophical study of being, or what exists. Certainly, though, we do find some metaphysical ideas in those who preceded him, especially Xenophanes and his criticism of the Greek gods, which is probably why later philosophers said that he was a student. Regardless of whether they actually knew each other, it's clear that Xenophanes' philosophy is the most obvious influence on Parmenides, in that both assert that the things in life which one thinks one understands may be quite different than they seem to be, especially regarding an understanding of the gods. Xenophanes' insistence on a single deity, who in no way resembled human beings, seems to have been the basis for Parmenides' claim of a single substance comprising all of reality. For those who need a refresher on Xenophanes, we discussed his philosophy in episode 20. Anyways, if Parmenides, indeed, was a student of Xenophanes, he left his master's discipline to pursue his own vision. The followers of Parmenides were often called the Eleatics, as they were all either from or lived in the city-state of Elia. And so Parmenides has been labeled by scholars as the founder of the Eleatic school of philosophy, which also included his own students, Zeno of Elia and Melissus of Samos. There will be more on those two shortly. The main doctrine of the Eleatics evolved in opposition to the theories of the earlier generation of philosophers of Miletus, those being Thales, Anaximander, and Anaximenes, as well as Heraclitus. The views of the Eleatic school, though, had some similarities to the Milesians and Heraclitus, in that they too sought a single, permanent reality. For the Milesians, the single permanent reality is either some material or immaterial substance, called arche. But for Heraclitus, who was an older contemporary of Parmenides, all things are constantly in motion, and all of existence may be summed up with the principle of perpetual change. But this is where the similarities between the two contemporaries end. Whereas both the Milesians and Heraclitus acknowledged and attempted to account for change, Parmenides had quite a different view. In fact, Parmenides denied the reality of change, arguing instead that change is impossible, and even that the notion of change is incoherent. Parmenides believed that being exists and non-being does not exist, and so if something changes, it is no longer the same as it was before, and therefore it does not exist. And since something cannot exist, change is logically impossible. For Parmenides, immobility, calmness, and stability were everywhere. The long years of political stability in the city-state of Elia may have influenced him in forming this concept of the static and stable nature of being. The single known work of Parmenides is an epic poem called On Nature, in which he tried to analyze what it means to say that something exists. It was written in hexameter verses in a poetic manner reminiscent of Homer and Hesiod. Only 160 verses have survived in fragmentary form, from an original total that was probably between 800 to 1,000. Thanks to its preservation from continuous discourse, largely by Simplicius, who lived in the 6th century AD and was among the last to see the poem intact. It was originally divided into three parts. In the first part, the proem, that introduced the entire work in a narrative sequence, Parmenides imagines that he is being carried off in the chariot of the sun god Helios, which is drawn by vigorous mares, representing the passions of the soul, and escorted by the daughters of Helios. After traveling beyond the beaten paths of mortal men, he arrives outside of a city near the pass of night and day. As guardian of the city, Parmenides found the goddess Dike, or Justice, who would not allow him to enter. But the daughters of the sun god Helios, representing the senses, persuade Justice to allow the poet to enter and to take him before the unnamed goddess, generally thought to be Persephone, in order to receive a revelation on the nature of reality. The goddess receives him and congratulates him for finding his way to a road that mortals do not travel. She tells him that he will learn two things, both the truth, which is certain, and the opinions of mortal men, which are uncertain. Because although one cannot rely on human opinions, they still represent an aspect of the whole truth. And so through her, Parmenides describes two views of reality, or what he refers to as the two ways, which correspond to the two remaining parts of the poem. Although he is often called the father of metaphysics, with this division we can see him making a major contribution to the field of epistemology, or the theory of knowledge. Xenophanes, in his philosophy, already distinguished between mere belief and genuine knowledge, but Parmenides goes much further here by devoting his poem to what is truth, or knowledge, and to what is a belief, or opinion. By using a goddess, this is likely not an attempt at mythological explanation. Rather, the goddess is a representation of pure thought. The goddess resides in a well-known mythological space, where night and day have their meeting place, and where all opposites are undivided, and so they are one. 
for Parmenides, night and day are cosmological principles. In the second part of the poem, known as Aletheia, or the way of truth, in which an estimated 90% of the work has survived, Parmenides offers a radical revision of everything that we think about reality. In it, he argues for the unity of being by explaining, through the goddess, how reality and everything that exists is one. Nothing ever changes or moves. Multiplicity of every sort is an illusion, whether it be different objects, colors, or events happening at different times. And existence is timeless, uniform, necessary, and unchanging. He introduces a primitive reasoning that precluded beginning and end, birth and death, growth and corruption, movement and change, and the divisibility and the non-continuity of being. All of this is shown through a relentless chain of argument, which proceeds on the basis of reason, rather than observations on the world around us. In doing so, he also formulates the principle of contradiction and demonstrates the possibility of logical proof. In trying to offer a rational deduction, he starts with the basic principle that there are two ways of inquiry. You can have is, but you can't have is not, because there is nothing that cannot be, and then proceeds to explore the consequences, whatever they might be. Whatever we may think of his arguments, this is a real quantum leap in the development of philosophy. Parmenides is not just trying to offer a rational explanation of what he sees around him. Rather, he tries to establish the nature of all reality with a purely abstract argument, using an explicit and complex deductive argument. This is an interesting contrast to Heraclitus, who had mentioned that he had used his eyes and ears to observe the world and to learn the laws that govern that world. And so, this is generally considered to be one of the first digressions into the philosophical concept of being, which contrasts with Heraclitus' statement that no man ever steps in the same river twice, which was one of the first digressions into the philosophical concept of becoming. Scholars have generally believed that either Parmenides was responding to Heraclitus or Heraclitus to Parmenides, though opinion on who was responding to who is not settled. But Heraclitus and Parmenides do agree on one thing, that everyone else apart from them is completely confused, unaware of the nature of reality. Here, Parmenides argues that the way of truth is the only path for a method of inquiry open to human minds. In other words, the other way is a path completely unlearnable. The third part of the poem is known as doxa, or the way of opinion. Although most of this part has not survived the ravages of time, it was clearly still quite extensive and was offered with serious intent. Parmenides says that if one is going to reject the way of truth and believe something false, then at least believe the falsehoods offered in the way of opinion. Parmenides thus seems to be setting out the beliefs that one should adopt if one isn't capable of grasping the fundamental underlying truth of the unity of being. Here, Parmenides explains the physical world as it appears in human experience, in which one's sensory faculties lead to conceptions which are false and deceitful. Simply put, Parmenides' argument is that since something cannot come from nothing, then something must have always existed in order to produce the sensible world. This world we perceive, then, is of one substance, that same substance from which it came, and we who inhabit it share in this same unity of substance. Therefore, if it should appear that a person is born from nowhere, or that one dies and goes somewhere else, both of these perceptions must be wrong, since that which is now can never have been not, nor can it never not be. In this, Parmenides may be developing ideas from Pythagoras, who claim that the soul is immortal and returns to the sensible world repeatedly through reincarnation. If so, though, Parmenides very radically departed from Pythagorean thought, which allows that there is a plurality present in our reality. To Parmenides and his disciples of the Eleatic school, such a claim would be evidence of belief in the senses, which they insisted could never be trusted to reveal the truth. And so we should not follow our senses, but follow philosophical argument wherever it should lead. In one fragment, he warns that the way of opinion is not to be trusted, as it is not as firmly grounded as the way of truth. It is still, though, the second best way, since it is the most plausible explanation of things, such as the heavenly bodies and the human body, which in the way of truth he showed to be mere illusions. And so, in the way of opinion, Parmenides proceeds to explain the structure of the becoming cosmos, which is an illusion, of course, that comes from the arche, or origin, which is the necessary part of reality, which is understood through truth.
Unsurprisingly, many people were not persuaded by the arguments of Parmenides, who became known as the philosopher of changeless being, that all reality is a single unchanging truth, repudiating relativism and mutability. But on the other hand, plenty of philosophers since him have given arguments that are reminiscent of his way of truth. For example, Plato, in the metaphysical formulation of his theory of ideas, learned a great deal from Parmenides, whom he greatly admired. In fact, Plato dedicated one of his famous dialogues to this important philosopher, which depicts an elder Parmenides and his student Zeno meeting a young Socrates in Athens to instruct him in philosophical wisdom. And the conversation between the two develops Plato's own theory of being. This is quite an homage to Parmenides, since in most of his dialogues, Plato presents Socrates as the wise questioner who needs no instruction from anyone. While Parmenides was an older contemporary of Socrates, it is doubtful that the two men ever met, and Plato's dialogue is considered an idealized account of the philosopher, though accurate in portraying Parmenides' philosophy. In addition, Plato also addressed Eleatic concepts in his dialogues, the sophist and the statesman, and the famous sophist Gorgias employed Eleatic reasoning and principles in his work, as Aristotle would also do later, principally in his metaphysics. Aristotle, although he may have learned about Parmenides through Plato, would interpret Parmenides' way of truth quite differently than his master did, and so he argued against Parmenides' theories and devoted considerable energy to explaining how change is possible, despite Parmenides' point that it would involve non-being. Closer to Parmenides' views, though, were his immediate followers, the Eleatics, who worked hard to defend the astonishing conclusions of their master. It was in pursuit of this aim that Zeno developed the most brilliant set of paradoxes in ancient philosophy, trying to undermine the possibility of change in multiplicity to make good on Parmenides' claim that no one could contemplate non-being without ending in self-contradiction. Little is known for certain about the life of Zeno of Elia. The primary source of biographical information about him comes from Plato's dialogue, Parmenides, and he is also mentioned in Aristotle's Physics. Plato informs us that he was 25 years younger than Parmenides, so he was probably born around 490 BC. Plato also says that Zeno was tall and fair to look upon, and as a youth was reported to have been beloved by Parmenides, seeming to imply that the two were in a pederastic relationship. Regardless, Zeno was Parmenides' most important pupil of the Eleatic school, so much so that when Parmenides visited Athens in Plato's dialogue, Zeno was right there with him. Plato also says that when Zeno was in Athens, he always had large audiences, because his theories, which were brought to Athens for the first time during his trip, stimulated the interest of the Athenians, and particularly of the young people. Since Parmenides had many critics, Plato has Zeno say that his work meant to protect the arguments of Parmenides, by seeking to prove the truth of his master's claims logically, and thus silence those who sought to prove him wrong. Plato has Socrates paraphrase the first thesis of the first argument of Zeno's work as follows, quote, If being is many, it must be both, like and unlike, and this is impossible, for neither can the like be unlike, nor the unlike like, end quote. There is uncertainty about how Zeno's book was structured and whether all of this work was contained in this one book. Although many ancient authors refer to Zeno, none of his writings have survived intact. Fortunately, Plato and Aristotle have managed to preserve a few of Zeno's teachings, as well as Simplicius. The Paradoxes of Zeno, known as his Puzzles, are by far his most famous work, and they demonstrate the unintelligible nature of the Eleatic school in support of Parmenides' theory that being cannot change or be more than one. Paradox is a Greek word from para, meaning against, and doxos, or belief. And so a paradox is a statement that, despite sound reasoning from true premises, leads to a self-contradictory or logically unacceptable conclusion. Zeno used these paradoxes to prove the unity of existence mathematically. Arguing against motion, the sense, and plurality, we know that he produced a whole series of paradoxical arguments. And according to Proclus, in his commentary on Plato's Parmenides, Zeno produced no less than 40 arguments revealing contradictions in plurality and motion, but only nine are now known. Some of these were apparently paired together as well. For example, he used one argument to show that if things are many, then things are finite. And then he used another argument to show that if things are many, then things are infinite. Taking the two together then, it can be concluded that if things are many, then they can be both infinite and finite. Which is obviously a contradiction. And so things are not many, and thus are one, just as Parmenides had taught him. 
Zeno's paradoxes have puzzled, challenged, influenced, inspired, infuriated, and amused philosophers, mathematicians, and physicists for over two millennia. The most famous are his arguments against motion described by Aristotle in his Physics, Book 6, including the race course, the Achilles, and the arrow. These are described because Aristotle is rejecting Zeno's views of space, time, and motion. According to Zeno, whenever you have to move from point A to B, you have to move to C, a point halfway between A and B. To do that, you have to move to the point between A and C and so on. By this progression, Zeno showed that no matter how small a distance was left, it is still impossible, logically, for anyone to ever meet their goal. No matter how far or near, there would always be a distance which separated you from the goal, and since there will be an infinite number of such points, meaning that to move from A to B you have to complete an infinite number of tasks, motion is thus impossible. And so, the swift-footed Achilles can never reach the turtle that gets a head start, because it is possible, at least in theory, to divide the distance, separating them eternally. Zeno claimed that everything is infinitely small, because the parts of which it consists must be indivisible, but simultaneously infinitely great, since with these endless divisions emerges an infinite number of parts of which the body is made, and since no matter how many are used, an infinite number will be left over, the body can grow ad infinitum. And so, Zeno's paradox of the halfway points shows that it should be impossible to move, but yet we still move all the time. Because of this, Zeno is also regarded as the first philosopher who dealt with the earliest, attestable accounts of mathematical infinity. Another famous paradox concerns a flying arrow that only appears to fly, but is actually motionless, because at any moment in time, which he calls the present, it is at rest in just one place. So at any instant, during the arrow's flight, it seems to be hovering motionless in the air, but yet during the whole time of its flight, the arrow apparently moves from bow to target. Zeno, though, would say that if motion could not happen now, it could not happen at all, and this is the intended conclusion. Because as a follower of Parmenides, he simply does not believe that anything can move. Not all of his paradoxes concern motion, though, as others deal with multiplicity. For example, object A and B must be separated from one another, since they aren't one continuous object, so there must be some third object, C, separating A and B. And so there must also be some fourth thing, object D, separating C from A, and a fifth thing, object E, separating C from B, and so forth. In his dialogue of the Parmenides, Plato sets down the fundamental criticism of the claims of Parmenides and Zeno when Socrates asks how the many can be one in the physical world, not just the abstract world. He uses it as an example wood and stones, and says that these cannot possibly be categorized as one, but must, out of necessity, be considered many. Zeno countered this argument by maintaining that trust in the senses leads to contradictory conclusions, and that something which exists, and is, cannot not exist, and not be, and yet our senses tell us that everything is always changing from what it is to something it is not. Through his paradoxes, Aristotle regarded Zeno as the inventor of the dialectique, or dialectic method, which at its base is a discourse between two or more people holding different points of view about a subject, but wishing to establish the truth through reasoned arguments. The dialectic resembles debate, but without all of the subjective elements, such as emotional appeal in the modern pejorative sense of rhetoric. It may be contrasted with the didactic method, where one side of the conversation teaches the other. Zeno's arguments are perhaps the first examples of a method of proof called reductio ad absurdum, literally meaning to reduce to the absurd, though Parmenides is said to have been the first individual to implement this style of argument. This form of argument soon became known as the epicherema in Book 7 of Aristotle's Topics. It is a conclusion that has been put forward as true, and a disputant sets out to break it down. This destructive method of argument was maintained by him to such a degree that Seneca the Younger commented five centuries later, quote, If I accede to Parmenides, there is nothing left but the one. If I accede to Zeno, not even the one is left. End quote. For this reason, Zeno would have major influence on the Sophists, Gorgias, and Protagoras. Besides what we know about Zeno's life at the Eleatic School, from Plato and Aristotle, other, perhaps less reliable, details of Zeno's life are given by Diogenes Laertes, who reports that he was a brave political leader who took part in an insurrection against Nearchus, a tyrant of Elia, who had him arrested and tortured brutally. 
Plutarch reports that during the interrogation, Zeno refused to reveal the names of his colleagues in the conspiracy. And so as to not betray his companions, he bit off his own tongue and spat it in the face of the tyrant. According to Valerius Maximus, though, Zeno bit off the tyrant's ear, after which Nearchus ordered that he be put to death by being crushed in a mortar. Regardless of how, Zeno is believed to have died around 430 BC. Melissus of Samos joined Parmenides and Zeno as the third and last member of the ancient school of Eleatic philosophy. Little is known about his life, but he was most likely born around 470 BC, though the date of his death is unknown. The little that is known about him is mostly gleaned from a small passage in Plutarch's Life of Pericles, which tells us that he was the commander of the Samian fleet shortly before the Peloponnesian War, as he defeated Pericles in the Athenian fleet in 441 BC, an event which we will cover in a future episode. According to Diogenes Laertes, Melissus was also a reported pupil of Parmenides, and he wrote a treatise of systematic arguments supporting Eleatic philosophy, called On Nature, that has been preserved somewhat by Simplicius in his commentaries on Aristotle. While not as influential as his fellow Eleatics, Melissus had the good quality of offering clear and direct arguments, because unlike Parmenides, Melissus wrote his treatise in prose, not poetry consequently making it easier to follow than that of his teacher. And so, because of its clear and concise nature, Melissus' version of Eleatic philosophy was the chief source for its presentation in the works of Plato and Aristotle. Aristotle, though, never hesitated to insult Melissus, whom he viewed as quite inferior to his predecessors, stating that his work was a bit crude and that he made invalid arguments starting from false assumptions. Although Melissus follows Parmenides and his general views in the framework of Eleaticism, and like Zeno, he attempts to defend his master, he also departed on some points and made original contributions and innovations to the substance of Eleatic philosophy. Like Parmenides, Melissus claims that being is one, and argued that reality is ungenerated, indestructible, indivisible, changeless, and motionless. He starts from the presence that being cannot have started, because in order for that to have occurred, it would have had to come from non-being, which is absurd. But here is where Melissus' philosophy differs from that of Parmenides in two respects. First, although Parmenides claims that being is limited in space, Melissus claims that being is wholly unlimited and infinitely extended in all directions, similar to Anaximander's Aperon. After all, if it had limits, there would have to be non-being beyond those limits, and there is no such thing as non-being. Secondly, Melissus also implies this concept of time. For Parmenides, being existed in a timeless present. But for Melissus, being is eternal. And so Melissus' developments upon Parmenides' ideas show that Eleatic philosophy wasn't just a static doctrine received from a master, rather that the theory itself changed and was taken in different directions by Zeno and Melissus, even at the price of contradicting the teachings of their master. Another one of his ideas, though, probably would have delighted Parmenides, that being his argument against the possibility of motion. Again, he starts by ruling out non-being, particularly emptiness, since there cannot be a place with nothing in it, meaning that void is impossible. Then, Melissus points out that if there is no void, then motion is impossible. After all, there would be no empty place for anything to move into. There were two responses to this, both told by Aristotle and his physics. Aristotle himself agreed that there is no such thing as void, but he insisted on motion anyway, because whenever one thing moves, something else is displaced. Aristotle reasoned that in a complete vacuum, motion would encounter no resistance, and quote, no one could say why a thing once set in motion should stop anywhere, for why should it stop here rather than there, so that a thing will either be at rest or must be moved ad infinitum, unless something more powerful gets in its way, end quote. The other response is that no place is totally full, and there is indeed void. Bodies move around in this emptiness, banging into each other, and this is more or less what we think today. Of course, we now believe that outer space is mostly empty, but also that every physical body on Earth consists of more empty space than full space, and that various imperishable, indivisible particles, called atoms, exist in the void. According to Aristotle, this conception, the forerunner of the atomic theory of the universe, was first brought forth by the so-called atomists, Leucippus and his pupil Democritus, in response to the Eleatic's denial of the existence of a void, and especially to Melissus. 
It was probably for this reason that Diogenes Laertes also says that Melissus was the teacher of Leucippus, though one must regard this with a fair amount of skepticism. As usual, the ancient tradition wants every famous philosopher to be the student of some other famous philosopher. Whether or not Leucippus was a student, it is clear that his treatise was influential on atomism, as were those of the other Eleatics. And now, let us take a short break for a word from our sponsors. The History of Ancient Greece is sponsored by the CLNS Media Network, and today's episode is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. You know what's not smart? Job sites that overwhelm you with tons of the wrong resumes. But you know what is smart? ZipRecruiter.com slash Greece. Unlike other job sites, ZipRecruiter doesn't wait for candidates to find you. ZipRecruiter finds them for you. Its powerful matching technology scans thousands of resumes, identifies people with the right skills, education, and experience for your job, and actively invites them to apply. So you get qualified candidates fast. No more sorting through the wrong resumes. No more waiting for the right candidates to apply. It's no wonder that ZipRecruiter is rated number one by employers in the U.S. This rating comes from hiring sites on Trustpilot with over a thousand reviews. And right now, my listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free at this exclusive web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash Greece. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash G-R-E-E-C-E. ZipRecruiter.com slash Greece. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. And now, let us turn our attention back to the ancient Greeks. Leucippus, or Leucippus in anglicized English, is a shadowy figure, and his dates have not been recorded. He is often mentioned in texts in conjunction as the master to his more well-known pupil, Democritus, a philosopher who was also touted as the originator of atomism, though Aristotle and his student Theophrastus explicitly credit Leucippus with its invention. To make matters worse, there was disagreement in antiquity whether Leucippus even existed. For example, according to Diogenes Laertes, Epicurus claimed that Leucippus never existed, and since he was the philosophical heir of Democritus, Epicurus's words held a lot of weight to many scholars. Furthermore, in his corpus Democritium, or the works of Democritus, Thrasyllus of Alexandria, an astrologer and writer living under the Roman emperor Tiberius in the first century AD, compiled a list of writings on atomism that he attributed to Democritus and excluded Leucippus. And so, controversy over this matter has raged on in modern scholarship. However, the present consensus is that Leucippus was historical, though it is difficult to determine which contributions to an atomic theory came from him and which came from Democritus, since in the sources, they are ascribed indiscriminately to both of them. For purposes of this podcast, everything credited to Leucippus must be understood with a caveat that Democritus probably assisted some, if not all, and so the views and achievements of Leucippus and that of Democritus must be regarded as a product of collaboration. Regardless, if Leucippus existed, he was most likely from Miletus, although Abdera and Elia are also mentioned as possible birthplaces. Since Miletus and Elia were the two cities most famous for pre-Socratic philosophies, and his pupil Democritus was said to have been from Abdera, this all seems to be too suspicious. Also, the precise period during which he was active is not known, but since he was mentioned as a contemporary of Zeno, Empedocles, and Anaxagoras, he was probably born at some point in the early 5th century BC. According to Diogenes Laertes, at some point between 440 and 430 BC, Leucippus founded a school at Abdera, with which his pupil Democritus was closely associated. And someone named Leucippus founded the city of Metapontum in southern Italy, which honored this Leucippus with a coin. We aren't sure if this Leucippus is the same as the philosopher, which only further throws more cloudiness onto the situation. Despite the fact that the work and teachings of Leucippus have not come down to us in their original form, two works are believed to have been written by him. According to Stobaeus, who in the 5th century AD compiled a valuable series of extracts from Greek authors, we learn that Leucippus' first work was called Megas Diakosmos, or The Great World System, in which he analyzed the physical basis of the atomist theory, explaining the creation and structure of the world in what is known as the Atomic Hypothesis. In response to Zeno's paradoxes of infinite division, Leucippus developed the concept of infinite smallness, with the logical implication of indivisibility, which hinged on the idea that it is impossible to keep dividing matter for infinity. For this reason, it is called atomon, meaning indivisible, or quite literally uncuttable, 
And so, Leucippus and Democritus are called the atomists because they believe that matter was created from particles so tiny that they are indivisible to the naked eye and that they were atomoi. In other words, Leucippus and Democritus formulate the theory that all matter in the world, including human beings, is indivisible as it is comprised of atoms that cannot be divided, and these atoms make up everything that we see and are. Their speculation on atoms bears a passing and partial resemblance to the 19th century understanding of atomic structure that has led some to regard Leucippus and Democritus as more of a scientist than any other Greek philosophers. And since the theory of the atomists appears to be more nearly aligned with that of modern science than any other theory of antiquity, many consider the more famous Democritus to be the father of modern science. However, the similarity with modern concepts of science can be confusing when trying to understand where the hypothesis came from. Classical atomists could not have had an empirical basis for modern concepts of atoms and molecules, and so their ideas rested on very different foundations, using abstract reasoning rather than scientific methods. And it's sadly ironic that atomoi, the Greek word for atom, which has been split in our own age with such devastating consequences, the atomic bomb, originally meant that which cannot be divided. And so the atoms from modern science have thus been misnamed since they can now be split into their respective protons, neutrons, and electrons, which themselves can be split into smaller particles. Still though, despite the fact that their theory about the indivisibility of the atom has today been disproved, the atomist's notion of the universe laid the foundation for further progress in scientific research. The other half of the atomist's picture of the cosmos, known as the void hypothesis, which again is a direct reply to Eleatic philosophy, particularly Melissus, introduced two opposing concepts, the full, consisting of atoms, which represents being, and the void, with no atoms, which is equivalent to non-being. The atoms accepted most of Eleatic philosophy, except for the idea that motion is an illusion. According to Aristotle, the atomists agreed with the Eleatic argument that true being does not emit a void, and since there can be no movement in the absence of a void, motion thus requires a void. However, whereas the Eleatics argue that there is no such thing as a void, and that motion does not exist, the atomists contended that we can plainly see that movement exists as an observable fact, and so there must be a void. And so the atomists identified the void with non-being, since nothing cannot really exist. When the atoms move into the void, they replace non-being with being. Leucippus thus differed from the Eleatics in that he was not worried about being encumbered by the conceptual intermingling of being and non-being. For Melissus, being is one and infinite, but for the atomists, being is many and infinite. The difference is that the atomists have integrated void, or non-being, into their world picture, and void separates out being into infinite many things, or atoms. Therefore, non-being, or void, is as real as being, or atoms. This idea would survive in a refined version as Newton's theory of absolute space, which met the logical requirements of attributing reality to not being. Einstein's theory of relativity provided a new answer to Parmenides and Zeno, with the insight that space by itself is relative and cannot be separated from time as part of a generally curved space-time manifold. And so Newton's refinement of the void hypothesis is now considered superfluous. Leucippus' second work, called On the Mind, contained his teaching about the operation of the senses and images. The senses, which led to the perception of the world, have as a starting point the intermingling of atoms, which according to shape, class, or position, create the impression of attributes that we see in the world around us. In other words, when atoms move through the infinite void, they collide and become interconnected in a variety of ways to form visible matter, referring to the objects and beings that are known to us. The different possible packings and scatterings within the void make up the shifting outlines and bulk of the objects that organisms feel, see, eat, hear, smell, and taste. While organisms may feel hot or cold, hot and cold actually have no real existence. They are simply sensations produced in organisms by the different packings and scatterings of the atoms in the void that compose the object that organisms sense as being hot or cold. Likewise, human perceptions are caused by the various shapes and connectivity of atoms. For example, the perception of bitterness is caused by small, angular, jagged atoms passing across the tongue, whereas sweetness is caused by larger, smoother, more rounded atoms. And so, although they believe that atoms are too small for human senses to detect, they theorize that they must be differentiated in form, order, and posture. 
For example, some atoms are convex, while others are concave. They reason that the solidness of the material corresponded to the shape of the atoms involved. And so, iron atoms are solid and strong with hooks that lock them into a solid state. Water atoms are smooth and slippery. Salt atoms, because of their taste, are sharp and pointed. And air atoms are light and whirling, pervading all other materials. Using analogies from human sensory experiences, they gave a picture or an image of an atom that distinguished them from each other by their shape, their size, and the arrangement of their parts. Moreover, connections were explained by material links in which single atoms were supplied with attachments, some with hooks and eyes, others with balls and sockets. Their atom thus is an inert solid, merely excluding other bodies from its volume, that interacts with other atoms mechanically. In contrast, modern quantum mechanical atoms interact via electric and magnetic force fields and are far from inert. For the atomists, the various possible encounters of the atoms are simple contact, collisions, repulsions or adhesions, as well as spiral whirling from which human bodies result. What determined the manner of these collisions was a little uncertain though. The order observed in the universe is thus a result of the inviolable application of laws determining the flow and whirling of atoms. From his second work, the following phrase has been preserved. Quote, Nothing happens at random. Everything happens out of reason and by necessity. End quote. Although Leucippus insisted that it was necessity and not chance, other later atomists disagreed, including the Roman philosopher Lucretius. But the atomic theorists all agreed on one thing. Whatever was active and shaping the form of matter was a natural force and not a divine being. This motion obeys purely mechanical laws with no principle of utility. Perhaps Leucippus' most important contribution to philosophy was his recognition that the true identity of every object comes only from genuine mathematical concepts, the violation of which can cause changes to the cosmic system. And so both Leucippus and Democritus were thoroughly materialist, believing everything to be the result of natural laws. And so questions of physics should be answered with a mechanistic explanation, such as what earlier circumstances caused this event. As a result, the notion of causality was introduced into philosophical thought for the first time by the atomists. While Leucippus's claims would seem to deny the possibility of human free will, his pupil Democritus wrote extensively on ethics and clearly believed that one could make free will choices within the parameters of atomic determinism. Furthermore, although some of the conclusions drawn by the atomists from this fundamental theory may appear naive, such as the senses of hearing and sight being due to emanations thrown off the surface of objects, which reach our ears and eyes when multiplied. Modern science recognizes in these conclusions the basis for subsequent theories of sound and light waves. Democritus was said to have been born around 460 BC at Abdera in Thrace, an Ionian colony of Teos on the northern coast of the Aegean Sea, though according to Diogenes Laertes, some believe that he was from Miletus. According to tradition, Democritus' father was from a noble family that was so wealthy that he received Xerxes on his march through Abdera, on his way to Greece, as we discussed in episode 37. But according to Strabo, Democritus spent the massive inheritance that his father had left him on travels into distant countries in the east in order to satisfy his thirst for knowledge. Among the places he was said to have journeyed to for knowledge was Miletus, where he received his early education in philosophy, and then throughout Greece to acquire a better knowledge of its cultures. He mentions many Greek philosophers in his writings, and his wealth enabled him to purchase their works. He also was said to have traveled to the Near East and to North Africa in order to study in astronomy and the natural sciences from Babylon, Persia, Egypt, and Nubia. During his travels, according to Diogenes Laertes, he became acquainted with and learned from Astanes, a Chaldean magi who was said to have accompanied Xerxes. Finally, he was said to have journeyed all the way to India, where he became acquainted with Indian ascetics. After returning to his native land of Abdera, he was now impoverished, but rich in experience, and so he occupied himself with natural philosophy. As we mentioned, Leucippus was said to be the greatest influence upon him. But he also praises Anaxagoras, who we will discuss next episode. And Diogenes Laertes says that he was friends with Hippocrates. With Democritus, we have finally reached a point where it is misleading to call these philosophers as pre-Socratics, because in fact he was an almost exact contemporary with Socrates.
However, he may or may not have been acquainted with Socrates, as Plato does not mention him, and Democritus himself is quoted as saying that he came to Athens and nobody knew him there, with the assumption that Anaxagoras was no longer in Athens at the time. Furthermore, Democritus is said to have been disliked so much by Plato that the latter wished all of his books to be burned. He was nevertheless well known to his fellow northern-born philosopher Aristotle. The many anecdotes about Democritus' life, especially those recorded by Diogenes Laertes, attest to his disinterest, modesty, and simplicity, and show that he lived exclusively for his philosophical studies. One story has him deliberately blinding himself in order to be less disturbed in these pursuits. While this seems unlikely, it may very well be true that he lost his sight in old age, though. Regardless, he was not a melancholic man like Heraclitus, but was cheerful and was always ready to see the comical side of life, which later writers like Seneca and Alien took to mean that he always laughed at the foolishness of people, and so he was popularly known as the laughing philosopher, and was often depicted in later artists such. He was highly esteemed by his fellow citizens, even though he was known as the mocker, because according to Diogenes Laertes, he had foretold them some things which events proved to be true which may refer to his knowledge of natural phenomena. There will be more on that shortly. According to Diodorus Siculus, Democritus died at the age of 90, which would put his death around 370 BC. Although almost nothing is known about the shadowy figure Leucippus, except that he was the teacher of Democritus, his pupil, on the other hand, was a prolific writer whose body of work, according to Diogenes Laertes, included over 80 known treatises. Unfortunately, none of Democritus' writings have survived intact, but a massive number of fragments and quotations are known. Both Cicero and Plutarch regarded Democritus' prose as worthy of a great author, and Dionysus of Halicarnassus did not hesitate to compare his style with that of Plato. Most sources say that Democritus followed in the tradition of Leucippus and that they carried on the scientific rationalist philosophy associated with Miletus. Democritus's interests were wider than just the atomic theory, though, and so we can see in his writing that he was interested in not only in philosophy and cosmology, but also in philology, literature, music, ethics, politics, anthropology, and biology. Democritus was also a pioneer of mathematics, and geometry in particular, as he was among the first to observe that a cone and pyramid, with the same base and height, has one-third the volume of a cylinder or prism, respectively. Later Greek historians consider Democritus to have established aesthetics as a subject of investigation and study, which is the branch of philosophy that deals with the principles of beauty and artistic taste, as he wrote theoretically on poetry and fine art long before authors like Aristotle. Specifically, Thrasyllus identified six works in the philosopher's corpus that had belonged to aesthetics as a discipline, but only fragments of the relevant works are extant. Hence, out of all of Democritus' writings on these matters, only a small percentage of his thoughts and ideas can be known. According to the Roman author Petronius, Democritus spent much of his life experimenting with and examining plants and minerals, and wrote at length on many scientific topics. Democritus thought that the first humans lived an anarchic and animalistic life, going out to forage individually and living off of the most palatable herbs and the fruit which grew wild on the trees. They eventually were driven together into societies for fear of wild animals. He believed that these early people had no language, but that they gradually began to articulate their expressions, establishing symbols for every sort of object, and in this manner came to understand each other. He says that the earliest men lived laboriously, and having none of the utilities of life yet, such as clothing, houses, fire, domestication, and farming. Democritus presents the early period of mankind as one of learning by trial and error, and says that each step slowly led to more discoveries. For example, they took refuge in the caves in winter, stored fruits that could be preserved, and through reason and keenness of mind, came to build upon each new idea. As we mentioned earlier, Democritus wrote extensively on ethics and politics, which came to us mostly in the form of maxims. Still, though, despite the large number of ethical sayings, it is difficult to construct a coherent account of Democritus' ethical views, as there is much difficulty in deciding which fragments are genuinely from Democritus. Regardless, in one fragment he says that equality is everywhere noble. However, he is not encompassing enough to include women or slaves in the sentiment. He also says that poverty in a democracy is better than prosperity under tyrants, for the same reason one is to prefer liberty over slavery. 
Democritus said that, quote, the wise man belongs to all countries, for the home of a great soul is the whole world, end quote. Harkening back to his many travels in his youth, Democritus also wrote that those in power should, quote, take it upon themselves to lend to the poor and to aid them and to favor them. Then there's pity and no isolation, but companionship and mutual defense and concord among the citizens and other good things too many to catalog, end quote. For Democritus, money, when used with sense, leads to generosity and charity, while money used in folly leads to a common expense for the whole society. An excessive hoarding of money for one's children is avarice. While making money is not useless, he says, doing so as a result of wrongdoing is the worst of all things. He is on the whole ambivalent towards wealth and values it much less than self-sufficiency. He considers education to be the noblest of pursuits, but cautioned that learning without sense leads to error. As we mentioned, he used his family's wealth in order to travel and gain knowledge. He also disliked violence, but was not a pacifist, as he urged cities to be prepared for war, and believed that a society had the right to execute a criminal enemy so long as this did not violate some law, treaty, or oath. Goodness, he believed, came more from practice and discipline, rather than from innate human nature. He believed that one should distance oneself from the wicked, stating that such association increases disposition to vice. Anger, while difficult to control, must be mastered in order for one to be rational. Those who take pleasure from the disasters of their neighbors fail to understand that their fortunes are tied to the society in which they live, and they rob themselves of any joy of their own. Democritus believed that happiness was a property of the soul. He advocated a life of contentment with as little grief as possible, which he said could not be achieved through either idleness or preoccupation with worldly pleasures. Contentment thus would be gained through moderation and a measured life. To be content, one must set one's judgment on the possible and be satisfied with what one has, giving little thought to envy or admiration. Democritus, though, approved of extravagance on occasion, as he held that feasts and celebrations were necessary for joy and relaxation. In fact, he was quoted as saying, Life without celebrations is a long road without ends. Like Parmenides, Democritus also wrote extensively on epistemology, or the knowledge of truth, which he confessed is difficult to understand, since all perception through the senses is subjective. This is because from the same senses derive different impressions for each individual. And so through our sensual impressions, we cannot judge the truth. We can interpret the senses as data and grasp the truth only through the intellect, because the truth is in an abyss. According to Theophrastus, Democritus argues that there are two kinds of knowing, the one he calls nesse, or genuine, and the other scoti, or secret. The secret knowledge is concerned with the perception through the senses, and therefore it is insufficient and subjective. The reason is that the sensual perception is due to the effluences of the atoms from the objects to the senses. When these different shapes of atoms come to us, they stimulate our senses according to their shape, and our sensual impressions arise from these stimulations. The second sort of knowledge, the genuine one, can only be achieved through the intellect. In other words, all the sense data from the secret must be elaborated through reasoning. In this way, one can get away from the false perception of the secret knowledge and grasp the truth through the method of inductive reasoning. After taking into account one's sense impressions, one can examine the causes of the appearances, draw conclusions about the laws that govern the appearances, and discover the etiology, or causality, by which they are related. This is the procedure of thought from the parts to the whole, or from the apparent to the non-apparent, using inductive reasoning. This is another example of why Democritus is considered to be an early scientific thinker, as this process is reminiscent of that by which science gathers its conclusions. As we mentioned earlier, Leucippus, or Democritus, held that originally the universe was composed of nothing but tiny atoms churning in chaos, until they collided together to form larger units, including the Earth and everything on it. In explaining how our cosmos formed out of the atoms, Democritus says that there has always been atoms, and they have always been colliding, meaning they're in motion. They don't just bounce off one another, though, but they also get entangled, partially because of their different shapes and sizes, but also because they have a tendency to gather with other atoms as a conglomeration. At the level of the whole cosmos, huge groups of atoms swirl around in a kind of vortex, with the heavier and bigger atoms towards the middle and the lighter atoms on the outside. The former making up the bodies of the earthly world, while the latter turns into the fiery heavens. 
And there is infinitely more universes since there is an infinite number of atoms, which exhibit every possible combination of atoms. He surmised that some of these many universes are growing, while some are decaying, and some have no sun or moon, while some have several. He held that every world has a beginning and an end, and that a world could be destroyed by collision with another world. Furthermore, Democritus was the first philosopher to posit that what we refer to as the Milky Way was the light of stars reaching our perception, and that the universe may in fact be a multiverse with other planets sustaining life, a theory which physicists today are increasingly recognizing as mathematically probable. Another thing that appears to separate Democritus from Leucippus is that he draws strikingly skeptical conclusions from his atomic theory. Like Parmenides, because the underlying reality of atoms and void is not evident to our senses, he criticized the senses, saying that things in the natural world are unreal, because the only thing that is actually real is the atomic universe that we can't see. In one fragment, he says, perhaps echoing Xenophanes and Heraclitus, that no one knows anything, and instead we make do with our own beliefs. His position, then, is that the atomic interactions explain why things appear the way that they do to us, but that appearance isn't real, as only the atomic interactions are. Here, Democritus has hit upon a major philosophical issue. Should we say that X is not real because really all that exists are the atoms that make up X, or should we say that X is real precisely because X is made up of atoms? Democritus takes the first option. He thinks that science explains our familiar everyday reality rather than by securing our reality by explaining it. By contrasting the reality of the mind with the appearance of the senses, Democritus argues that only mind can tell us about the atomic theory, and this undermines what the senses tell us, even though sensible reality is supposed to be grounded in events at the atomic level. We can find this deference to the mind elsewhere in Greek philosophy too, as no Greek philosopher pays greater tribute to the mind than Anaxagoras, another thinker who tried to preserve the reality around us from the results of Parmenides' arguments. On the next episode, in responding to the Eleatics, the pluralist school of philosophy saw Anaxagoras posit that nature contained an innumerable number of principles, while Empedocles reduced nature to four elements, which could not be reduced to one another, and which would be sufficient to explain change and diversity. At the same time, the first generation of Pythagoreans after Pythagoras would make great advancements themselves and influence others in the field of mathematics and astronomy. So join me next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 84, Pluralists and Early Pythagoreans. Thank you.